very good morning to you all and you're very welcome to uh, this week's Signpost webinar. I hope you're keeping safe, safe and well wherever you're joining us from today. Uh, this series is brought to you by Chagas in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network, and Dairy, uh, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. And we have Pat Murphy, head of the Chagas Environment KT programme, assisting us with questions. So good morning to you, Pat. Morning. And just before we introduce our, our main guests, I just want to, to talk about the, the, the main issue that we're going to be speaking about today is uh, the use of antilmentic uh, uh, products and uh, internal parasites we know are a major challenge to grass-based production systems across the world. And parasite control is largely based on suppression using what are called antilmentic pr products or drugs. However, there is growing concern around the emergence of drug-resistant parasites. And one man who is leading the charge to combat antilmentic resistance is Bruce Thompson, who is a dairy farmer based in Ballyfin, County Leash. And uh, today, Bruce is going to speak to us about protecting dung beetles while managing parasites. So, Bruce, you're very welcome to the Signpost webinar series. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Pat. How are we doing? Great. All well down in County Leash this morning? Yeah, great. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, well, look, it's we, we got a little bit of rain there the weekend, so the, the place is looking a little bit greener than it did a week ago, anyway. So, yeah, hopefully that will get get things moving again. Um, yeah, I think everybody who's uh, planning their summer holidays is probably <laughs> hoping for a bit of dry weather. So, it could be could be a bit of a conflict there. But Bruce, you could you tell us a little bit about uh, your setup there in uh, in Leash? Is it is Ballyfin, isn't it? Yeah, uh, you're correct. It? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah, we're we're, um, we're milking uh, milking dairy cows here in a, a spring calving system. Um, it's uh, conventional type, so um, yeah, we're we're, uh, we're calving our cows in, in a nine week period and maximising the production from grass. Um, so look, I suppose I, I came home and farming in two thousand and three. At the time, there was fifty four cows on the farm, and my dad had lost. 48 of those with tuberculosis. So I suppose animal health was always a big, a big scarring on, on our minds at the time and has, has kind of stuck with us. Um, yeah, so look, since the quote abolitions, then we've, we've uh, pushed on to 300 cows this year. Um, so yeah, I suppose that's, that's kind of a bit about, about ourselves. Um, we keep all the young stock in the farm as well. So half of our farm is now owned and half is rented. So that's, that's our business today. Very good. And this this time, 20 years ago, could you have imagined yourself speaking about dung beetles on a, a webinar? <laughs> I'd say if, if you were to go back five years, Pat, I, I wouldn't have even maybe two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't even know what a webinar was five years ago, Pat. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what brought you to this um, and what led to your interest in dung beetles? And, and you, you completed a, a Nuffield scholarship recently. Maybe you just explain what's involved there as well. Yeah, so the, with the, the, what created me interest, well, I, I, I was on a safari down in South Africa, um, it was over 10 years ago with my then girlfriend, now wife, and we saw this this big uh, telecrocod, uh, which is the, the big rollers that you see David Attenborough showing on, on National Geographic, rolling a big ball of elephant poo across the plain. And uh, I was absolutely fascinated and thought, you know, that, wouldn't it be a great addition if we had dung beetles in Ireland to, to bury the dung into the soil at the roots of the grass? And um, thought no more of it. And uh, fast forward on a few years, myself and dad were, were um, with, with the intensification on the farm, we found ourselves dosing calves more, worming cows more, and um, decided that, you know, that there was something maybe not clicking 100% right. Um, and it seemed to be the accepted management strategy at the time. But we, we started, you know, taking a more of a diagnostic approach from, from that day on. And a chance conversation then with, with Dr. Sally Ann Spence, an entomologist over in the UK about dung beetles. She actually said uh, that there was dung beetles on my farm, even though I didn't know about it. And that the fact that I had reduced my wormers meant that I was probably um, having to worm animals less because they were getting rid of the um, the the, the uh, parasite eggs out, out of the dung pats. And then um, I went out to my paddock in excitement just to see, was this true? And lo and behold, here was dung beetles uh, working away on undeterred, Mark. 
Um, <laughs> I like so it. I like it. That, that got me. That got me interested in the the whole the whole helmet, the the uh, parasite control of of uh, aspect of with dung beetles. So I, I did a bit of research into it and got very uh, engrossed in it and decided to to further. Um, find out about it um, to, to scratch the itch, I suppose. Nice. They applied for a scholarship and it was absolutely fantastic to, to get it meant that I could, could research this further. So that was... Brilliant. Well, look, okay. we'll ask you to share your screen with us. You have a, a short presentation for us to, to, to tell us about your, your uh, I suppose, journey so far with, uh, with this, this subject. And um, I, I know it, it, it gives some really excellent slides, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Just to remind everybody that uh, if you have a question for Bruce, you can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, and also today's session has been recorded and the Bruce's presentation will also be available on the Changus website. And um, if you are hard of hearing, uh, we have the live transcription uh, running there at the bottom of your screen. If you do find it a distraction, you can switch it off at any stage if you wish to do that. So Bruce, we'll hand over to you and uh, look forward to uh, the, the Q&A afterwards. We can see okay. your screen perfectly there as well. Okay. And can you hear me as well, Mark? Yes, yes, perfect. Yeah, that's, that's good, yeah, just doing an acoustics check. Um, so here we go, these are dung beetles, um, and I'm going to speak to you today about how, they, how they're affected by anthemintics and how they actually reduce parasite loadings. So here's, here's the, the very first dung beetle I was talking about. It was so enthralled by it that I, I took a photograph of it. Um, so that guy, that guy changed, changed me, uh, <laughs> my perspective on things. Um, that's a little bit about the Nuffield. Um, I'm a 2020 scholar. I'm very, very thankful to Nuffield Ireland for, for um, investing a lot of the resources into me uh, to investigate this topic. Um, I'm, as I'm a 2020 scholar, I didn't get to do much traveling. However, I did get to do uh, a, a bit in last March around South Australia and Tasmania um, to investigate the dung beetles there. Um, so we are looking at, at dung pats as being a noxious weed sitting on top of the soil. Um, they, and we need to get them into, into the grass where they're, they're a, a nutrient rich source um, right at the roots. Uh, but the, the dung pats are full of all sorts of flora and fauna, as you can see from this picture. Um, they all, they're all co uh, coprophagous, which means that they, they feed on, on feces. Um, and the, the more that they feed on the feces, the, 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 uh, the quicker they degrade into the soil. So we, we, these are, are, are important for um, nutrient recycling and for the destruction of the dung pat. Uh, the one I'm focusing on, of course, is the dung beetle. So in, in dung beetles, we have two general types. So we don't have those rollers in, in Ireland. We have two, um, two general types. We have the, the dwellers that live in the dung pats and they lay their eggs in the dung pats and hatch in it. And then we have the, the, the tunnelers and they actually dig holes into the ground and lay their eggs in the soil. Um, now, so this is a, a positive feedback loop. So that these guys, um, if they're encouraged, will, they have benefits to, to, to farmers. Um, they reduce the parasite and, and fly loadings on, on pasture. And as I hear on there, they, they, uh, re, they, um, they're, they're an important source for or so important part of the breakdown of the dump pad. So. You're, you'll have more efficient uh, nutrient recycling because the, the dung pat's broken down quicker, there's less nitrogen um, lost to the atmosphere. It might, might sound small fry, but it, it, all, it all adds up. Um, there's less risk of the, the, uh, the dung pat being, being lost to the, to the atmosphere. And um, the, I, I mentioned there, I went down to Australia and Tasmania. One, one of the reasons that they, they actually imported beetles and bred them in, in that country that was why I, I, I traveled there they had a, an awful problem with well a flies and b pasture fouling they actually had a high percentage of their, their pasture land covered in dung pats prior to importing these beetles um why did they have to import them well in in australia they imported cattle and sheep in, in the late 18th century but they didn't bring the dung beetles with them and as 
farming intensified throughout the, the 19th century that they, they found these dump paths were, were sitting around for, for years before they actually uh, literally dried up and disappeared. The dung, the dung beetles, um, so they don't actually eat the dung pat, they actually drink it. Um, they drink the juices out of it. And in doing so, they dehydrate it. Um, if you go to a, a half, uh, half degraded dung pat and dig it up with a spade, you will see that it's, it's completely alive with, with earthworms. The earthworms actually, they, they really, they're the ones that really, really do the work. But the, the problem is the dung pats are too wet and sloppy when, when they're fresh. Um, they taste like as when they're when they're fresh. So the, the dung beetles dry them out to prepare them for um, encroachment by the, the earthworms and bring them into the soil. And then they're, they're, the dung beetles themselves are also a transport service. They're a taxi for phoretic mites, and I will talk with them in a second. Um, the benefits to the environment then. Um, so the, the dung beetles, in, in uh, reducing the, the amount of dung pats that are on pasture and burying, burying it into the soil, they're reducing the risk of the uh, of, of water runoff going into um, from these dung pats going into waterways, and they're are a, an important food source for predators. Bats are a big one, um, but small birds, cold ticks as well. Um, and I believe that, that buzzards actually eat the, the big the big geotrubies, they're the burrowers. Um, I haven't haven't seen that happen yet, but I'm told to do. Um, there are species that deserve recognition in their own right. So there, there's a lot of them in the country. We don't we don't really realise them. Farmers tell me that they don't have dung beetles on the farm. They do have dung beetles on the farm. Um, they're just in, in small numbers. Uh, so yeah, here's a paper that's written by um, Max Anderson. Um, He's doing a PhD over in the UK, and he's he's looking at how different grazing strategies um, affect the, the amount of dung beetles and the type of dung beetles, and what effect that has on bat species. So you can see even even a small difference between a lay and a permanent pasture that he's seen a, a, a different um, a different passing of bats um, over the, over those fields. Uh, so the, over in the UK then, um, Brian e. Sands in the University of Bristol has done a field experiment on, there's, there's a number, number of these experiments, but I, I particularly like Brian's one because it's very, it's very real, it's, it, it's using this similar species to what we have in Ireland, if not the same, and it's, it was done in field, so it was, it was open to the weather, and um, whereas we're seeing uh, in any of these experiments that are done either in lab or out in field, we're seeing reductions of between zero and 100% in terms of, of parasites uh, emitting from these, uh, reduction in parasites emitting from these dump pads. Brian is one, which is a very real one, uh, was at about 30% reduction over a 10 week period on, on grassland. So it's, it's, it's very true that they, they do reduce um, in, in gastrointestinal parasites in their animals. The problem is uh, there are decline in population. So really we need as many of these dung beetles as possible to, to uh, process these dung pats. Um, but the problem is we, we, the populations of them are declining. Um, so they really are up, up, uh, up the creek, I suppose. Um, why are they declining? Well, the, the antimitics, um, that's our worm, wormers um, and synthetic pyrotides. Those, those products are very damaging to the to the populations of the beetles because not, not only do they are they toxic that they kill them but the, as as uh, as these products are leaving the, the animal over a period of, of weeks um, the persistency has some lethal effects so in other words it affects their um, affects their their reproduction capabilities and then other other things are probably smaller effects but they do have an effect there's some species will, will emerge over the winter in, in the autumn and early spring. Um, but we, we could have animals taken off fields or have less dung pats around. So they come up, they come up and they're, they're, they're basically hungry for, for food um, that's not there. They don't like high grain diets and they don't like the liquid dung pats that Bruce has on his farm from his dairy cows. Um, pasture harrowing and tailing animals doing that, that's very damaging as well. Uh, or ploughing, in, in effect, is, that's particularly damaging to the tunnelers, as, as you can imagine. 
Uh, the other thing with anthematics is they are they're, we're finding other environmental issues with them. Here was a paper that was released, I think it was last year, by, by Trinity College. They, they did a, a trial on 88 sites around Ireland and they, they sampled the water and on um, 18 of those sites, sorry, 18% of those sites, it was actually found that there was anthematics presence in the water. Um, that, that, that was groundwater now, so uh, you're looking at springs and wells, uh, which, is, which is worrowing, wor worrying. Another effect then was Gillian Gilbert up on the Isle of Islay, which is between Northern Ireland and Scotland, um, has dis discovered that the the reason for the main one of the main reasons for the chuff population declining on, on the island was the combined use of triclobendazole and synthetic pyrotides. So that is a warmer, but that's actually triclobendazole is for fl fluke and synthetic pyrotides that you pour on for flies. Um, they're called flight repellents or flight control. Um, that reduced the amount of um, uh, pu pupae uh, um, in the dung pats from dung beetles that the fled little fledglings were we used to feed on to get up to, to target weight for overwintering. Also then another issue, another threat for the antimitics is resistance and that is becoming more of a problem. Um, Basically, the, the, the rule is wherever we look for resistance, we find it. It's just that we're not looking for it. And that was another thing I was, I was looking at down in, in South Australia, in Tasmania, was the effects that resistance, which is a lot more ac accelerated down there, the, the problems that that is creating with farmers. So we have farmers there that um, they're not able to put sheep onto some proper some properties because of uh, a particular parasite called Hemonchus contortus. Um, so that that beetle is, or that that parasite is becoming a problem. But that's it's getting more, more of an issue here. We're seeing more so in sheep, but it's starting to creep into cattle now as well. That we're we're seeing resistance with, with uh, problems with resistance, um, and also in, in, uh, next year from next year onwards, we have to look for prescriptions for these products. So we have to demonstrate a need for them. Um, now I will like to say at this point, I'm not I'm not trying to be Aaron Brockovich. Um, these products are very, very important. I, I use them on my farm, and I don't think I'll be able to farm in the system that I'm in with without antimintics. Um, reducing stocking rates uh, won't won't, won't uh, affect uh, or won't solve the problem either. So we have to we have to think about this. We have to really concentrate on where we need to use antimintics and, and if we need to use them and what animals they need to be used on. Um, so we, we need to uh, we need to make sure that these products are going to stay working for us in, in future. Um, so this this is a, a slide that shows uh, it, it, each line is is a different animal group, different management group, and we can see here uh, the red line is that's typical of what we're doing in, in Irish farms. So we're looking at. Uh, we're not really minding the free living stage of the parasites, so we're not we're not considering um, what the loading is too much for, for this is this is for uh, for sh for sheep. Um, we're, we're not really considering what the loading is on pasture, but uh, at five thousand eggs per day with a, 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 a typical system where we're worming worming every twenty one days, the animals are are performing just average is all we, is all we can say. Whereas if you look above that, uh, the, the animals that were, were given a low uh, parasite burden actually performed better with no antimintics being used rather than the ones with, with, uh, with antimintics being used on, uh, on what, what's typical um, uh, pasture management. So this is a, a pilot scheme that a fellow scholar, uh, Rob Howe, who's a vet over at LLM Vets over in the UK, and last year he uh, tried out a pilot scheme with, with a number of farmers. Uh, we can see there was none of them here doing any feedback and testing before, the, before the, the pilot scheme. And he got um, he, he got 94 94% of them to actually do fecal egg pants. And 69% of those farmers um, started using uh, wormers based on the 
based on the results from the fecal egg counts. And because of that, then uh, there was a massive reduction in the, in the MLs and the macrocyclic, the MLs and the macrocyclic lactones, and they are one of the most damaging ones to the, to the environment. So they, they got a massive reduction um, in, in the use of, of macrocyclic lactones. And uh, yeah, as we can see, then we, we go on here that um, the 63% of the farms use a, a lungworm vaccine, and that that's a it's a fantastic way of uh, of ensuring that um, you, you don't have to go in with, with a worm because of of coughing during the middle of the season. It's something maybe we need to work on in this country. We haven't. We haven't really uh, hit on the, these lungworms or lungworm vaccines. It's not, it's not new science. It's, it's there for a long time, uh, but it's something we need to look at a bit more. There's a lot of, a lot of issues with coughing and lungworm on farms. So what are we doing on our farm? Then um, we can see here that that we uh, we we look at, at the, the calves first on the farm uh, to build resistance. So the, the, we look at the calves as being. The most the most problematic when it comes to parasites for two reasons one is that they actually emit the most amount of parasite eggs because they have no immune system so they're not suppressing the parasites they're, they're a real vector for for parasites um but the other thing is that they're also they're, they're also the most naive so uh they're, they're at, at the highest risk um so we have to look we have to we concentrate on these jobs the cows have two types of immunity or the cat, cattle have two types of immunity they have um, innate and adaptive um, the innate is, is what they're born but that's genetic um, we won't talk, talk about that too much uh, only that ICBF are doing, doing a bit of work there particularly around um, uh, liver fluke but um, it's it, it's a, it's a, it's a real long a long uh, a long approach the, the real low hanging fruit here is the adaptive resistance so that's the resistance that the, the calf, each individual calf, builds itself when it gets exposed to parasites. Um, and they need, they need to be exposed, but need to be carefully exposed. Um, so overprotecting them using long-acting products is, is not the answer. Uh, so we, we, on our own farm, we use this approach called traffic-like grazing. And that's where we, um, we map the farm in terms of uh, pa parasite fouling. Um, so this this can be based on calves. So the calves walk uh, as they're grazing around the farm, um, taking into account that they're leaving high loads of parasites behind them. We mark the paddocks yellow. So that's uh, that's considered medium risk, and red risk then is when they fail on a fecal egg count test. And we're also noting the the parasite, which is important as well for for ones that are seasonal, like like lungworm, for example. So we, we've we need to keep the calves moved. So they're moved, the, the, uh, the calves are, they get, only get three days allocation of grass and they're back fenced. Um, so we invested a lot in portable equipment and we've no designated calf paddock. Those, those calf paddocks, they have to go, they're, they're, they're a big problem. So you can see the type of portable equipment we're using, water troughs, um, and this is a, uh, something that I made with my farm manager. It's, it's a pipe reader for, rolling up water pipes and um, then taking into account then the, the where the contamination is in in the pasture itself so we can see here from this slide that the the, the highest level of uh, infected stage larvae is down in, in the, the bottom five centimeters of grass so therefore we, we don't want to be grazing calves down tight um, so we, we actually we, for the calves, particularly for the first first half of the season, um, is we, we graze, what we do is we graze them on heavier covers. So this would be, we're going into a cover of about 2,000. Uh, also, I, I suppose, uh, not related, the uh, summer scour syndrome um, is not a problem when you're grazing grass, not so much a problem when you're grazing grass like this. Um, the calves rumen is not fully developed, so stronger grass is probably better for them anyway. Um, this is only done with the calves. I will, I will make that point. And as the season goes on, then we, we tighten them up. Um, we use a, uh, we, we're actually doing our own fecal egg counts, but there's plenty of labs around the country and uh, that, that provide the service. Um, 
it's it's not it's not expensive and it's not hard to do. There's nothing complicated about it. Um, so the diagnostics then tell us when we need the dose. So we go in then to the calves, um, and we're looking at the there's an industry no, uh, rule. Kind of, it's called the eighty twenty rule, and that is that. 80% of the parasites are in 20% of the animals. So we, we're looking, we really want to focus on, on getting the, that, that 20%. Um, the top, top animals in, in, the, in the, the herd don't need to be worked, um, generally speaking. So the first point to make is the right product. So we're looking, uh, as it's a dairy farm here, we're looking at using the levazamol first in the calves because we can't use that um in, in lactating animals so we're, we're trying to hedge our bets on on, on keeping uh, the the macrocytic lactones and the bends and the dazos for later on um so yeah the right time that's that's to do with the the uh, fec so the right amount of cream warm to know the way to the cows and get that correct um refuse them that's that's a safe refuge for uh so uh for Parasites that we know are susceptible to the to the wormer. So you're going to get that when you don't worm all the animals in the group. Um, so basically, what that means is if you if you take an animal and you worm it, and you have say 10% of the worms in, in that that event actually surviving the animal, that that 10% are potentially resistant to the product. So. Um, the genes of the gene pool created by that 10% can be quite damaging. So we, we need that gene pool to be diluted down by uh, the genes of the parasites that are in the in animals that weren't dosed, if that makes sense. So uh, basically what we need to do is keep parasites on the farm that we know are susceptible to wormers that, uh, and we can keep those in animals that are not being affected. So we're weighing the calves and we're looking at target weights in the, in the calves uh, based on uh, performance, previous weights, and uh, genetic disposition. So after the worm dose then, uh, these calves go out onto what we call the dump paddock. And this paddock is used solely for the purpose of putting the calves on after they're dosed. So they're, they're onto this for two to three days and they expel the highest concentration of wormer out onto these paddocks. Um, so that, that means that as those products, as we say, are damaging to the to the to um, uh, dung beetles, um, we're, we're trying to keep that in one spot, and it's a, it's an area that doesn't get used too often. So it, it's kind of uh, it's kind of concentrating the problem into one area rather than diluting it around. Uh, I will say that last week we went in our first worm into the calves, and fifty percent of them were worm dosed, and the rest of them were all fine. And uh, that was out of, I think, with 83 there in that event. Uh, in terms then of flight control, uh, to get away from our synthetic pyrotides, which is our our, uh, our, fly, our, our fly repellents, uh, we are using more, uh, we're putting on our hemp underpants and we're wearing, we're, we're using these uh, alternative products. So with Stockholm tar and eucalyptus oil, uh, they are, they are, they are more earnest to put on. I've been using these now for three years and I've, I've been actually been getting better results from them uh, based on the amount of heifers coming into the parlour with blind quarters. We've had no summer time, time of status. We haven't had that in years anyway, admittedly, even with the synthetic pyrotides. Um, so the problem with this is you have to go more often with it and it's a pain to put on. Um, and there's my voice radiator roller, which you now know is where it is. Um, and the, all of this then leads to the milking cow herd. So my milking cow herd haven't been wormed since 2017 at, at any point. And the milk elisa testing, that's the antibody levels of, of astratagia, which is a stomach worm. The, the readings for that in the milk tank haven't been, um, haven't been rising. Um, now it's, it's a young herd, so its performance is, is, uh, hasn't been realized yet. Um, so we, our, our fertility figures are, haven't been affected and our milk solids have actually increased in, in, in the face of it being a young herd from 432 kilograms in 2017, which was the last time we wormed the cows, up to 458 last year, which is in line with the genetics of the herd. And I will definitely use antimintics if and when I need. 
Um, then on to my dung beetles then, this is an experiment we, we, we were trying out on last year. We were catching beetles and breeding them. Um, so I mentioned earlier about the, um, the phoretic mites. You can probably see them here uh, crawling around on the tops of these beetles. Um, yeah, the, those mites actually ate uh, the juice and spies. So the, um, and there's a train of thought that they might consume parasite eggs, but I'm, I'm not 100% certain on that yet, but they definitely do. They definitely do eat the fly larvae. So we're, we're trapping beetles and we, we, we took into breeding them. Now, the, the problem is that this is quite laborious. So because of that, we had to, we had to revisit the, our, our, our ethics on the, on the farm. Um, and here was the, the help we got um, for the job. These work for snacks and fruit juice and I find them quite efficient. Um, so that's my son and, and my daughter working away there, dig, digging out for a, a breeding cage. And this is one of the this is one of the first ones we made with, with the field breeding cages for, for the beetles. Um, and this is an indoor incubator type of system. Now, unfortunately, last year with the with the restrictions, I wasn't able to get my starter stock. This is specifically for the, the tunnelers, which I think have the the most to bring to most benefits to bring to agriculture. Um, uh, but I wasn't able to get my starter stock. Unfortunately, you could only get one or two beetles here and there, and indeed couple of hundred to get, get the thing rolling. Uh, so uh, with a group of other people there in, in, uh, in the UK, I have produced this website uh, called dumbbeetlesforfarmers.com. And we were in Groundswell this year. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to travel, but you can see there that the following of people that, that seem, to be, seem to be looking at these beetles, it, it's creating a, a bit of traction. They are a, a really good indicator species. So if, you've, if you have a good few dung beetles on your farm, there, uh, you, you can be fairly sure that there's a, a, a good uh, e e uh, nutrient cycling system taking place on your farm. Um, and also, uh, if, if people think that, that dairy farmers are, <laughs> are anti-environment, my own, my own discussion group have, have recently been awarded an EIP for looking at, um, looking at this whole area and um, we've gotten funding to do so. And, it was it was embraced with open arms by the, by the whole group. So that's that's me, and that's that's where we're at with dumb beetles and and, um, and parasite control. So thank you for listening, and maybe you can kind of get a grasp now on this whole feedback loop. And the dumb beetles are are, are positive. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, really enjoyed your presentation and very. Uh, you know, excellent messaging coming out of there that there is a, you know, a, there is a, a place there for nature-based solutions. And for me, I suppose we're, we're, we're really only discovering uh, what nature can offer really, aren't we, in relation to, and, and I, I suppose we have to be so cognizant of that when we are developing new approaches uh, to, to uh, farming approaches. Um, so you've obviously, you've, you've shared the website there uh, that, that farmers can, and, and anyone can log on to that to find out, you know, how they can support dung beetles on their farms. Is that sort of information? Yeah. There? Yeah. So it, it, the group that we produced is, is, is a very unusual group. It's we have ecologist, uh, environmentalist, um, a, a vet, um, a conservation farmer, and I'm the I'm the bottom rung, rung of the ladder. I'm the <laughs> I'm the dairy farmer in it. So it's it's a very balanced group. It gives a very balanced look at um, the the problems and the solutions to mm. solutions to increasing these these species on your farm. So yeah, it's it's very comprehensive, and we're we're continually updating it. Yeah, well, congratulations for bringing it to this stage because uh, there's many people that would you know maybe keep it keep it as far as their own farm but i mean you're spreading the word so that that that, that too is to be applauded um in terms of the the, the research into sort of non-chemical control do you think that there's enough happening there to to uh, support you know because down the line uh, are we expecting that there will be less and less amplomantics uh permitted or being used in agriculture what, what, what sort of future would you like to see there yeah, well, we are we are looking at, at a reduction in, in antimentic, so it's going to have to happen. Um, well, like we, we have the, the pres prescription, the HPRA are labelling it as prescri prescription only medicines from next spring, so we have to demonstrate a need for using it now. 
Um, so they're not they're not any, any longer going to be seen as a management or sorry a control. Um, they're going to be seen as part of the management from now on. Um, so that that's going to create a, a reduction um, in, in terms of looking at the alternatives. There's, I suppose look, there's an awful lot of snake oil out there and, and a lot of mixed messages. And, and yeah, we, we need to be looking at, at alternatives. There, there's no new products coming on the market. So we're really, in cattle, we, we have three products and we have five and cheap, and that's it. Um, so we're, we're not looking at any you know, new chemicals coming onto the market to, to control parasites. That, that's not going to happen. Um, but the alternatives, yeah, look, Stockholm Tower there for flight control, that's... That that works. It's just laborious, you know. If, if we could come up with a with a, 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 a solution for applying that a bit, a bit easier, it, it would certainly be a massive help. Um, grazing strategy, genetics, you know, all these things lead into into um, negating the need for using these products in the first first place. So I think that's that's where the game is at. Yeah. We're not going to get into no, I don't think we need to look for silver bullet for a replacement for, for antimentics. We, uh, we, we have been looking at controlling these these parasites in the animal itself, in the host, but now we're, we're going to have to start looking at uh, managing them out at, at the free living stage out on, on grassland. Thanks, Bruce. The, the, um, a comment here and, and, and question, uh, fantastic presentation and best of luck with the EIP. Um, organic farmers have for decades spoken of the detrimental effects of certain wormers on other worms of the soil. Um, the question here is how does liming affect the dung beetle or, or do we have any uh, understanding of, of that? Yeah, well, I, I've, I haven't come across it at all, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I couldn't see that there'd be any issue. They are quite... Uh, they're quite tolerant to, to that, those sort of things. I know um, down in Australia, they're actually washing the the imported beetles with with formaldehyde to, uh, to to clean them of any fungus. So I'd say I don't see that line. It would be an issue, but I, I'm only guessing. I, I haven't seen any research on it. Pat, lots of questions coming through there for Bruce. Yeah, uh, and I suppose a very practical one. Uh, you're down the line a little bit. What are the first steps that you would encourage other farmers to take uh, on the, the journey to encouraging dung beetles? That's a, a really good question. So I, I, I would say have a chat with your vet. Tell them you, you want to have um, take a diagnostic approach to, um, to your, your parasite control on your farm and incorporate using... Um, there's a, you can do faecal egg counting, milk testing, and uh, have, every time you go pick up a bottle, have a chat with your vet and, and see can can you work on, on reducing it. Um, you'll be surprised the reductions that can be made in in, in wormers when, when you start asking the question. There's a question there. Uh, I suppose given a higher level of of activity and and the integration of materials into the soils, is there a possibility that it will help with sequestration? That, that actually, yeah, I came across that down in in, uh, in Adelaide. They were actually um, feeding cows, dairy cows, uh, biochar in their meal. Um, and these these cows went out, out to the paddocks then and they they were uh, introducing a, a species called Antophagus faca, which is a, one of those tunnelers we were talking about. And they were tunneling down this the feces then from the cows containing the biochar into the soil. And we're measuring the, the level of carbon in the soil prior to and uh, post um, introduction of these beetles after a number of years. It was a pilot scheme and the farmers are they're actually going to get paid there, which is a bit of an issue last week as we've been hearing. But they're actually going to get paid for the sequestration of carbon into the soil down there, which, which is really good. So, yeah, they do. They do help. Yeah. Even without the biochar, I, I, I have no doubt about it. Uh, there's, you, you talked about the AC20, and uh, you might just go back on, on a little bit on, on how exactly you're picking the, the 20. Is it purely on the basis of, of performance, or are there other uh, signals that you're, you're picking up on? Okay, so yeah, look, the, the AC20 rule, I, I, I'm actually not just dosing 20% of the herd, or right. 20% of the calves. I, I would, what, what it, it's different parameters. So you start weighing the calves, 
So I suppose, firstly, look, reverse back to it, we're doing fecal leg counts. When the fecal leg count goes above a certain level, that, that says to me my cows need to be wormed. And we go in then with weighing scales and weigh each calf individually going into crush. Um, at that point, then, we are looking at the average daily live weight gain and we, we use EBI then for with the predicted calf weight um, and it's target based on that. Um, and if, if it's not hitting both of those, it's wormed. And also, it, we, you you would uh, good stockmanship then as well. So if you have a, if you have a calf with a wet tail or is looking a bit miserable, or uh, even if they are hitting those targets, we would worm that calf as well. Um, so our last visit there was was fifty percent of the calves. That was the first one this year. Fifty uh, percent of the calves were wormed. Um, it's 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 going to be impossible to, to to tell exactly the worm burden of each calf unless you go and do a fecal egg count for each calf um, and that's not practical the weighing scales is a really good practical way of selecting calves um, and of course good, good stockmanship Bruce we have a lot of interest around the, the traffic light system you spoke about and how that how does a, a paddock go from a red paddock to a green paddock um, also a question here in relation to uh, the same within the same same from the same person. Is there any ch ch uh, change in chemical sprays used on, on paddocks, for example, Roundup or chemical sprays for docks on a farm? Do these have an impact on dung be beetles? Do we know? So two two questions there. And okay, I, I, the, the sprays I don't know. Um, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, and haven't again haven't come on any any uh, any information on it. Um, the traffic light thing, yeah, that, that's a really good question. So. Um, so we're, if you're if you're looking at a paddock that has a high worm worm burden on it, um, and you're assuming that it's high, if you come in with animals that uh, like old dairy cows that are, are susceptible not susceptible to shouldn't be susceptible to worms, if they graze it, they're going to they're going to hoover up a lot of the, um, the parasites and shouldn't affect them. Uh, the other way is to come in with a mower and mow the grass off and put it into bales or, or into the pit. Um, rest period is another thing. So if it's if it's red in 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 August um, or September and that's not going to see animals for whatever reason or another until next spring, you know you, you can kind of assume that you could bring that back to an orange at that point um, because the, the period of, period of time uh, between. Uh, animals is, is going to affect um, between grazing is going to affect the uh, amount of uh, effective larvae that survive on pasture. The question there is to uh, there's a, a couple of mentions of the EIP. What is is the proposal? What exactly are you going to be doing in the EIP? Yeah, so we 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 still have a good bit of um, ironing out to do in it, but we're. We're taking a, a, a diagnostic approach to, to antimintic usage and made a commitment to not use macrocytic lactones on calves. Um, so that, that there are two, two main areas and we're, we're looking at uh, building shelters then for, for other insects around the farms and um, we're baselining as well. So we're looking, we're actually going to get a baseline. And it's one of the regrets I have on my own farm is that I didn't, before I started taking a diagnostic approach, I didn't actually uh, get a baseline done on my farm to know what insects are there. I know there's more insects on my farm now than there has been for years, but I, I can't actually quantify it. Whereas we're, we're getting in a, an entomologist to do a, a, a wide, a wide scale, um, fairly wide scale uh, representative uh, baseline on, on the farms to, dis, to decipher what ones we've there so that we can we can show an improvement. And is it all dairy farms, or is it a, a, that are going to be involved, or is it a, a, a variety of different types of farms? No, it, it's it, it's a dairy, it was a dairy farm, a Chagas dairy farm group, and that it, it's born from that. So it's all it's all dairy farms. Yep. Uh, and a question there: Is there much difference in the types of dung beetles uh, that are uh, found on for different species uh, and, and I suppose different grazing systems? Yeah, there is. Um, there, there's uh, there's some some species that be very common. Um, some prefer sheep. Some prefer cattle. Uh, some will only be seen one with one or the other. Um, some cross over different soil types. Uh, th there's a lot of different factors that, that affect them. Um, you, and uh, the, 
the diet of the animal would have a, have a bearing, a, a big bearing on it as well. Um, so, for example, like you wouldn't, you, you mightn't see as many uh, geotropies in, in your typical uh, dairy farm, uh, but you would have an awful lot of uh, species there called Aphodius rufipes. Um, seem to they seem to like the, the liquid paths more so. Um, so there is yeah, there's big variations in, in what you see where. In terms and of the sorry, right. I just had a question here, uh, Bruce, in relation to the economics of this. Um, have you seen any savings uh, on your farm, um, or have you been able to quantify that? Um, um, I, to be honest, yeah, Mark, if, uh, probably, but the issue is with. Bruce stays asking questions and buying microscopes and building shelters. That he, <laughs> <laughs> he, every few cent that he saves, he spends back on it. So it, it's been for me, it's been cost neutral. But yeah, yeah, definitely. Like it, it, leaving the dung beetles aside, if you just take a diagnostic approach, you would make savings on on, on antimintics. And it doesn't happen. The big saving isn't in the first year. It's when those calves get up to uh, being mature stock. Um, because the quantity of stuff that we're using in dairy cows is, is phenomenal. It's, um, you know, if we can reduce that, that's when we make, start making money or start saving money. Um, so are, yeah. there other, are there any other um, enablers that you think it could, could be put in place to support this uh, across the country? Uh, I'm just thinking it in terms of policy or schemes or... Uh, I know if, I think some of the, the uh, discussion groups or some of the department schemes have supported fecal egg uh, counting in the past as well. But uh, aside from that, are there any, any other uh, things that you'd like to see happening there at that scale? Yeah, there's, there's lots we could do. So um, we, have, we have a lot of information in, in the country. We're just not, not recording it and collating it very well. Now, that's probably been a bit critical. We're not collating it as, as well as we could be. Um, with ICBF, they're doing a fantastic job in, in terms of genetics. Um, if farmers took a diagnostic approach, recorded the information on the, on, on the herd app, it's really easy to do. As were, as were um, I, I shouldn't have said herd app, I should have said farm software company. Um, uh, and um, that, that goes into a database that ICBF could, could access. We, we would actually find bloodlines of animals that are gen, uh, genetically uh, dispositioned to be resistant to parasites. Um, and we're, we're seeing that with the liver fluke peeping through, even though it, it's uh, at the factory stage, it's probably a little bit construed by uh, people using um, uh, fluke control in, in the animals. So I suppose, look, Particularly if we start all, uh, a lot of us start using a diagnostic approach and weighing scales for animals, uh, we, we will see the ones that are performing better when the, the feet hit the ground and we can take those bloodlines and enhance those. Um, so that, that's a particular area. Um, we, the vets have, they have, they have a, a big job on hand to be fair to them um, and they, they need to be worked with. We, we, the farmers need to start we, we don't want to be ringing our, vet, our vets when, uh, when we have a problem. We want to be ringing our vets when we don't have a problem. So we should, we should be paying our vets for, for healthy animals, not paying them for sick animals. So farmers need to, we need to take a different approach, have a chat with our vets. Um, th that has been kind of, uh, with, with the knowledge transfer uh, scheme that was on there a few years ago, that, that kind of did start off a few conversations, particularly around antimitic usage, or sorry, antimicrobial usage, but uh, if that was enhanced upon and uh, taken up more a bit more, that, that would be a big help. Uh, and then, look, in, industry should be getting involved in this as well. Um, there's going to be less less scare of um, maybe residuals of these products be, being around. Um, so it's you know it's it, it's in their interest too. And I know down in in Tasmania, the the milk processors put in money into importing it was actually an Irish species uh the geotropes spinager um he's found in Ireland they they in, introduced him into a, a catchment area of, of a river to uh, solve algal blooms so you know, the, the 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 industry can kind have a big impact onto into what can what can be achieved as well so that's their kind of a few areas I, I could go on for days mark but <laughs> 
There's a, there's a question here. Do you see a, a, a potential for a side enterprise in, in, in breeding uh, beetles and supplying them to, to colleague farmers? Okay, yeah. Well, look, the, the yes, probably. But the, the issue is um, the, the beetles, when you breed them like that, it, it's not a matter of buying them in a box, let them out, and the job done. They will go, if, if you're going to go out with your macrocytic lactone or your neighbour uses it, they're going to go and they'll be dead straight away. So it's not it's not the answer. Like the answer is in, in the grasslands and the analytic uh, management. Um, so yeah, look, there there is there there's certain a certain call for I think the those geotropies, the, the tunnelers to be to, for work to be done with them. Definitely that. There's probably other species. There's, there's over 40 species in the country, so I, I, I wouldn't know them all I and mean, I know exactly what ones are where, but there's the, the more diversity you have in the dump path, the, uh, the harder they work. So it, it's important that we have diversity. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a silver bullet answer right. either. The question there in relation to the dump paddock and did you consider uh, water connectivity in selecting your, your dump paddock? Uh, at, at the time, no, um, but it's something we've talked about since because at the time we, we started at that, uh, we didn't realise that the, um, the, the most prolific um, Andamintic in, in that, that case, that the case study that um, Trinity College did was actually benzimidazole. Um, I didn't realise that I, I, I would have put my money on, on a macrocytic lactone to be the, the most problematic, but it was it was benzimidazole. Um, it's, some, it's something I've been rethinking, all right. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So uh, the, the, I, sorry, could you just remind us, Bruce, again at the website, um, because I, I, there's quite a few people just wondering. What... Yeah, so it's www.dumbbeetlesforfarmers.com. Okay. Yeah. B E E. <laughs> yes. So B E A T. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll just share that in the chat for everyone. Sorry, Pat. No, I. Uh, uh... In terms of the, the milk recording uh, and the, the results from the, the milk recording, uh, there's just a question as to how that uh, operates and what kind of results are you getting and how, how do you relate those to, to action? Okay, so um, it, the, the important thing with these results, this is why I, I, I say talk to your vet. Um, we're not doing individuals, sorry to, to state that, we're not doing individuals um, for for milk recording for ostracized readings for uh, uh, parasites. So um, the interpretation of results is is very important. So if you're seeing a high reading in in ostracized levels in, in your 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 milk, it might not actually mean that there's that there's that's disease. My, I saw mine there this year was was moderate enough. Um, I was getting a little bit concerned. You know maybe. I do need to go, maybe I don't. Um, this was a bug tank reading, and um, I we, we had an unfortunate incident completely un, uh, unrelated to disease. That we had a, a, we lost a cow uh, in the yard here and uh, last month. So we sent we got a rabbit mason from the the, uh, the processor and sent it into the lab for analysis, and there was no signs of any ostracasia in the in the animal. So that put my mind at ease, saying that um, you know we haven't got a problem there with, with that worm in particular. Um, the interpretation part of it is that I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with the test; it was 100% perfect. I have no problems about that. But it, it's it's telling me that the animals have become, have become exposed to to the ostracasia. Um, so if you have particularly a lot of young stock in a herd, uh, they're going to show up with higher readings than, than older animals as become exposed. You just have to be very careful about, about interpreting um, the results. There's a question there in relation to, to workload, and, and I, I, I suspect you're not, probably not the best person to ask it in terms of, of the workload you, you put in. But taking a farmer who takes on uh, this this approach, I presume there's 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 uh, positives and negatives. Uh, uh, less time dosing, but a lot of time put into other uh, elements of the, the the process. Where do you see the balance? Is is this something that could be a time negative or time 
neutral for, for, for a farmer. In other words, not going to uh, mean a huge amount of extra effort to do, I suppose, the right thing in, 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 in a lot of, or if that's the way you want to put it. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Um, so in terms of the physical stuff, so uh, you're going to, to herd your calves once a day anyway. So, you know, once every two or three weeks, take a, a fecal egg count. It, it do, it's not that big of a job to do. You're not catching calves to do fecal egg counts. You don't do that. Um, you, you take a pooled result, take a pooled sample of a number of fresh dung pads. Yeah. So that's that's not, not an issue. Post it off to the lab. Um, in terms of actually dosing, you're, you're, you're spending less time dosing. Um, so you're saving time there um, in that regard. Um, and look, the, it, the dosing process takes a little bit longer because you're weighing. To be honest, probably should be doing that anyway. To it's beneficial to 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 a dairy farmer to get get his, his dairy stock up to target weight by using as little inputs as possible. Um, so you you're being more measured with performance then. So you you know if you need to intervene with with concentrates or not, then you can make that decision uh, based on on the performance of them. Um, management end of it, there is a bit more than that, and uh, you, you need to be just it, it, look at the, the likes of traffic light grazing. It takes it takes a little bit of um, what's the word discipline, I suppose, just to, to fill it out as you're going along. It's not that big of a job. To do. We, we have it on a clip chart thrown around the truck. Um, so it's just when you move the calves, just just mark it. Um, I suppose moving the calves. Look, as it, as it said, your calves will perform better in in a system where they're. Um, they're, they're not exposed to heavy worm burdens. So you're, you're going to gain from um, additional performance for the animals by moving them more regularly. Uh, it sounds a bit earnest in moving calves every three days, um, but if you have a field set up, it's, um, you just move a tape um, in front of the calves once every three days. It, it literally only takes 10 minutes to do that. Um, it's just when you go move from one field to another, that takes a bit longer, obviously, but we'll be doing that anyway. So, yeah, look, I suppose maybe time is probably neutral, <laughs> long and short of it. Yeah. And I suppose a final question, just in terms of the, you mentioned, talked about dry and wet there right at the beginning, the impact of, of uh, weather conditions, drought, very wet weather in, uh, in terms of dung beetle populations, is there a... a are they impacted or, or do they merely go on their way regardless of weather? Yeah, well, look, I know water table has, has an effect on, on the tunnelers. Um, but after that, I'm not really sure. But I did notice when I was catching beetles last year, um, you would think that you would catch more in the, in the dry weather. But it was actually, it was, it was just after the rain that I caught my biggest catches. Um, I'd be going out to the traps expecting to see nothing in them and they'd be, they'd be full of beetles uh, just after after a, a, a night rain, for example, um, you, you seem to get a lot of beetles. Um, so I, I look, I, I don't know overall what, what effect the rain yeah. would have on, on, uh, on populations, if that's, if that's the question. Um, but the appearance of them seems to, seems to follow uh, a fine day after, after wet, a wet day. Okay, uh, we're, we're, we're unfortunately we're right up on time. Pat, did you have a final comment there? You no, no, just to we'll watch the space with the, the, the EIP and, and okay. hope that you keep the, the, the information flowing out of that through the, the websites that you have. So I presume that's yeah. the plan. Really, really inspiring presentation and, and, and an innovative project, uh, Bruce, and, and continued success to you and the, the, your colleagues and the, the EIP group. And like Pat said, we, we really would love to to, to get an update maybe down uh, in, a, in a year's time or so when you have maybe some outputs from that. Uh, but uh, thanks yep. thanks for your time this morning and uh, excellent presentation. Uh, reminder to everybody that um, we will be joining you next Friday uh, with an update on the Agricultural Sustainability uh, Support Programme. And so we have Noel Meehan and Joe Crockett, uh, Noel Meehan from Chagas and Joe Crockett from Dairy Sustainability Ireland uh, to discuss that. And uh, we do uh, look forward to uh, seeing you next week. Uh, thanks to our, our production team, uh, Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher.
Uh, I'm going to be taking a few weeks of a break, uh, so um, hand you into the capable hands of, of Pat, and uh, I think Porik uh, is going to be assisting you as well, Pat, and uh, so I look forward to seeing you all, uh, hopefully with a bit of a, a refresh uh, in, in at the end of August. So with that, we thank you. You still have to come in on your Friday morning, though. You, 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 you couldn't leave us without watching us. Like you, you hardly trust us that much. Uh, I don't think my mobile broadband will be good enough now where I'm going, Pat. So uh, I'll be trying to switch off as much as I can. But uh, I, hope it, I hope it goes well for you. <laughs> okay, Bruce, thanks again. And uh, Pat, thanks for help, helping with questions this morning. And we'll see you all next week. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, folks.